Good afternoon. This is Pamela, and you're listening to Watchmen on the Pod. We are going to continue in our book reading of Rome's Responsibility for the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln by Thomas M. Harris, who lived during that time. All right. Mr. Bateman adds, after this, the conversation was continued for a long time. Everything he said was of a very deep, tender, and religious tone, and with all tinged with a touching melancholy. He repeatedly referred to his conviction that the day of wrath was at hand and that he was to be an actor in the struggle which would end in the overflow of slavery, though he might not live to see the end. After the further reference to a belief in divine providence and the fact of God in history and conversation turned upon prayer. He freely stated his belief in the duty, privilege, and efficacy of prayer, and he imitated in no unmistakable terms that he had sought in that way the divine guidance and favor. The effect of this conversation upon the mind of Mr. Bateman, a Christian gentleman whom Mr. Lincoln profoundly respected, was to convince him that Mr. Lincoln had, in his quiet way, found a path to the Christian standpoint that he had found God and rested on the eternal truth of God. As the two men were about to separate, Mr. Bateman remarked, I had not supposed that you were accustomed to think so much upon this class of subjects. Certainly your friends generally are ignorant of the sentiments you have expressed to me. He quickly replied, I know they are, but I think more on these subjects than upon all others, and I have done so for years, and I am willing you should know it. More than once I felt as if I were in the presence of an old prophet when listening to his views about the future destinies of the United States. In one of my last interviews with him, I was filled with an admiration, which it would be difficult to express when I heard the following views and predictions. It is with the southern leaders of the Civil War, as with the big and small wheels of our railroad cars, those who ignore the laws of mechanics are apt to think that the large, strong, and noisy wheels they see are the motive power, but they are mistaken. The real motive power is not seen, it is noiseless and well concealed in the dark behind its iron walls. The motive power are the few well-concealed pails of water heated into steam, which itself directed by the noiseless, small, but unerring engineer's finger. The common people see and hear the big noisy wheels of the Southern Confederacy cars. They call them Jeff Davies, Lee, Toombs, Beauregard, Sims, etc., and they honestly think that they are the motive power, the first cause of our troubles, but this is a mistake. The true motive power is secreted behind the thick walls of the Vatican, the school, the colleges, and the schools of the Jesuits, the convents of the nuns, and the confessional box of Rome. There is a fact which is too much ignored by the American people, and with which I am acquainted only since I became president. It is that the best and the leading families of the South have received their education in great part, if not in whole, from the Jesuits and the nuns. Hence those degrading principles of slavery, pride, cruelty, which are as a second nature among so many of those people. Hence that strange want of fair play, humanity, and implacable implicable hatred against the ideas of equality and liberty as we find them in the gospel of Christ. You do not ignore that the first settlers of Louisiana, Florida, New Mexico, Texas, South California, and Missouri were Roman Catholics, and that their first teachers were Jesuits. It is true that those states have been conquered or bought by us since, but Rome had put the deadly virus of her antisocial and anti-Christian maximums into the veins of the people before they came, became American citizens. Unfortunately, the Jesuits and the nuns have in great part remained the teachers of those people since. They have continued in a silent but most effective way to spread their hatred against our institutions, our laws, our schools, our rights, and our liberties in such a way that this terrible conflict became unavoidable between the North and the South. As I told you before, it is to Popery that we owe this terrible civil war. 
I would have laughed at the man who would have told me that before I became the president, but Professor Morris has opened my eyes on that subject, and now I see that mystery. I understand the engineering of hell, which, though not seen or even suspected by the country, is putting in motion the large, heavy, and noisy wheels of the state cars of the Southern Confederacy. Our people is not yet ready to learn and believe those things, and perhaps it is not the proper time to initiate them to those dark mysteries of hell. It would throw oil on a fire which is already sufficiently destructive. You are almost the only one with whom I speak freely on that subject, but sooner or later the nation will know the real origin of those rivers of blood and tears which are spreading desolation and death everywhere, and then those who have caused those desolations and disasters will be called to give an account of them. I do not pretend to be a prophet, but though not a prophet, I see a very dark cloud on our horizon, and that dark cloud is coming from Rome. It is filled with tears of blood. It will rise and increase till its flanks will be torn by a flash of lightning, followed by a fearful peal of thunder. Then a cyclone such as the world has never seen will pass over this country, spreading ruin and desolation from north to south. After it is over, there will be long days of peace and prosperity, for Popery, with its Jesuits and merciless Inquisition, will have been forever swept away from our country. Neither I nor you, but our children, will see those things. Many of those who approached Abraham Lincoln felt that there was a prophetic spirit in him, and that he is continually walking and acting with the thought of God in his mind, and only in view to do his will and work for his glory. Speaking of the slaves, he said one day before the members of his cabinet, I have not decided against a proclamation of liberty to the slaves. I have not yet, but I hold the matter under advisement, and I can assure you that the subject is on my mind by day and by night more than any other. Whatever shall appear to be God's will, I will do. A few days before that proclamation, he said before several of his counselors, I made a solemn vow before God that if General Lee was driven back from Pennsylvania, I would crown the result by the declaration of the freedom to the slaves. But I would have volumes to write instead of a short chapter where I could give all the facts I have collected of the sincere and profound piety of Abraham Lincoln. I cannot, however, omod- admit no omit his an admirable and solemn act of faith in the eternal justice of God, as expressed in the closing words of his last inaugural address of 4th of March, 1865. Finally, do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God's will that it continue until the off till all the wealth piled by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, until every drop of blood drawn by the lash shall be paid by another drawn by the sword. As we said 3,000 years ago, still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. These sublime words falling from the lips of the greatest Christian whom God ever put at the head of a nation only a few days before his martyrdom sent a thrill of wonder through the whole world. The God-fearing people and the upright of every nation listened to them as if they had just come from the golden harp of David. Even the infidels remained mute with admiration and awe. It seemed to all that the echoes of heaven and earth were repeating the last hymn, falling from the heart of the noblest, truest gospel man of our days. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Psalms 19.9. Is that 19.9? No. I don't know what. It's X-I-X. I'm sorry, guys. I don't, I'm not familiar with Roman numerals. Okay. The 6th of April, 1865, President Lincoln was invited by General Gratt to enter Richmond, the capital of the rebel state, which he had just captured. The 9th, the beaten army of Lee, surrounded by the victorious legions of the soldiers of liberty, were forced to lay down their arms and their banners at the feet of the generals of Lincoln. The 10th, the victorious president addressed an immense multitude of the citizens of Washington to invite them to thank God and the armies for the glorious victories of the last few days and for the blessed peace which was to follow these five years of slaughter. 
but he was on the top of the mountain in Pisgah, and though he had fervently prayed that he might cross the Jordan and enter with his people into the promised land, after which he had so often sighed, he was not to see his request granted. The answer had come from heaven. You will not cross the Jordan, and you will not enter that promised land, which is there so near. You must die for your nation's sake. The lips, the heart, the soul of the new Moses were still repeating the sublime words, words, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. When the Jesuit assassin Booth murdered him, the 14th of April, 1865, 10 o'clock p.m. Let us hear the eloquent historian Abbott on that sad event. In the midst of unparalleled success, and while all the bells of the land were ringing with joy, a calamity fell upon us which overwhelmed the country in consternation and awe. On Friday evening, April 14th, President Lincoln attended Ford Theater in Washington. He was sitting quietly in his box, listening to the drama, when a man entered the door of the lobby leading to the box, closing the door behind him. Drawing near to the president, he drew his from his pocket a small pistol and shot him in the back of the head. As the president fell senseless and mortally wounded, and the shriek of his wife, who was seated at his side, pierced every ear, the assassin leaped from the box, a perpendicular height of nine feet, and as he rushed across the stage, bareheaded, brandished a dagger, exclaiming, Six Imper Tyrannus, and disappeared behind the side scenes. There was a moment of silent consternation, then ensued a sin of confusion, which it is in vain to attempt to describe. The dying president was taken into a house nearby and placed upon a bed. What a scene did that room present. The chief of a mighty nation lay there senseless, drenched in blood, and forgive me, I'm sorry. The dying president was taken into a house nearby and placed upon a bed. What a scene did that room present. The chief of a mighty nation lay there senseless, drenched in blood, his brains oozing from his wound. Sumner, Farewell, and Colfax, and Stanton, and many others were there, filled with grease and consternation. The surgeon, General Barnes, solemnly examined the wound. There was a silent as of the grave. The life and death of the nation seemed dependent on the result. General Barnes looked up sadly and said, The wound is mortal. Oh, no, General, no, no, cried out Secretary Stanton, and sinking into a chair, he covered his face and wept like a child. Senator Sumner Tindler held the head of the unconscious martyr, though all unused to weep. He sobs as though his great heart would break, in his anguish his head falls upon the blood-stained pillow, and his black locks blend with those of the dying victim, which care and toil has rendered gray, and which blood has crimsoned what is seen. Sumner, who had lingered through months of agony, having himself been stricken down by the bludgeon of slavery, now sobbing and fainting in anguish over the prostate form of his friend, whom slavery had slain. This vile rebellion, after deluging the land in blood, has culminated in a crime which appalls all nations. Noble Abraham, true descendant of the father of the faithful, honest in every trust, humble as a child, tender-hearted as a woman who could not bear to injure even his most envenomed foes, who in the hour of triumph was saddened, lest the feelings of his adversaries should be wounded by their defeat, with charity of all, malice towards none, endowed with common sense, intelligence never surpassed, and with power of intellect, which enabled him to grapple with the most gigantic opponents in debates, developing abilities as a statement, which won the gratitude of his country and the admiration of the world, and with graces and amiable ability, which drew to him all generous hearts, dies by the bullet of the assassin. But who was that assassin? Booth was nothing but a tool of the Jesuits. It was Rome who directed his arm after corrupting his heart and damning his soul. After I had mixed my tears with those of the grand country of my adoption, I fell on my knees and asked my God to grant me to show to the world what I knew to be the truth. 
that the horrible crime was the work of popery, and after 20 years of constant and most difficult researches, I came fearlessly today before the American people to say and prove that the President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by the priests and the Jesuits of Rome. And I'm going to end that there, brothers and sisters, and then I'm going to pick it up later. Forgive me. I, my heart's so tender when it comes to this stuff. But I wouldn't change it. I love you all so very much. Keep your eyes on Jesus, brothers and sisters. Your nose in the book, which is the word of God. And embed the word of God upon the tablets of your hearts. So you will not sin against God or be deceived. I love you all. Bye-bye.